Good evening. It's really wonderful to see all of you here this evening. As most of you know, the university lecture dates back to 1950. It was conceived to honor Boston University's most distinguished scholars and researchers and to bring together their work to the attention of the university community and to the broader public. It's a great tr tradition that we celebrate tonight. If you scan the list of the earliest lecturers, you'll note that then as now, lectures are drawn from across the university from all disciplines, humanities, science, social science, medicine, and the arts. Boston University is an institution full of world-leading faculty making important contributions to all fields. Many fields seek to understand the forces of nature. Researchers in photonics harness light to invent new methods for detection and communication. In the College of Fine Arts, our visual artists capture light and shadow in order to illuminate, inspire, and provoke. Our speaker tonight, Josephine Halverson, is a visual artist who emphasizes firsthand on-site experience as she works across the media of painting, sculpture, and printmaking. She creates works that induce us to appreciate the world in which we live and find wonder in the everyday. If you're not already familiar with her work, I encourage you to learn more, as you will tonight. But perhaps starting as we typically start these days with a Google search. That's the great thing about being a visual artist. You have something compelling to post uh, that's not in a tweet. Uh, that can tempt the curious to want to see the real thing. Josephine is Professor of Arts and Chair of Graduate Studies in Painting at Boston University. Under her leadership, graduate painting has risen to become the number one program in Massachusetts and the number six in the nation, according to US News. She earned her BFA at Cooper Union and her MFA at Columbia. She was a student in the prestigious Yale Norfolk Summer Residency Program. She has received numerous awards and honors, including Guggenheim and Fulbright fellowships, scholarship, uh, fellowships. She was the first American pensionnaire of the French Academy in Rome and was artist in residence at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Halverson. Well, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> thank you, President Brown, um, not just for this honor and for the introduction, but also for your years of service and leadership for BU. Um, <clears throat> I also want to thank Provost Morrison uh, and the University Lecture Committee um, and uh, Dana Clancy for putting my name forward and, um, and, and Dean Young for the opportunity to share my work and research with you all. Uh, I have a couple more thank yous, um, also to Dean Young, Associate Dean John Amund, um, and Professor Lucy Kim, because your support helped me make some of the work that I'm going to share with you today. Um, and I also just wanted to thank all my colleagues who are here and, um, and, uh, and everyone who came out tonight, especially since it was a late night with the election, so uh, results coming in. So thanks so much for being here. Um, so you've probably, um, if you've been coming in uh, over the last um, uh, uh, several minutes, you might have seen some glimpses of student work up on the screen. And I'm just going to flip through them in case you haven't had a chance to look at them. These are images of uh, recent alumni and current student uh, work um, in chronological order from I arrived here in 2016. And I wanted to show them because I want to give you a sense of the range and diverse approaches to what painting can mean today. It's, a, uh, um, uh, it's quite a spectrum of what is possible. And that's largely because of um, how much it's tied to the individual, their lived experiences, their muscle memory, uh, what they've seen, what they've kind of you know, internalized, and then what they externalize. And I just want to take a moment to say that, um, uh, uh, you know, to be an art student today is not easy. And it takes real courage. It takes conviction. 
in the society that we live in. And I am humbled and to work with um, graduate fine art students who have really made a commitment to art in their lives in many different forms, however it takes, um, you know, as they go through life. Painting is something that can kind of help you make sense of the world as you go through it, literally, a kind of sensation of things. And, um, and one's work evolves and develops over time, as I'll share with you later tonight. But I think it's safe to say that um, you know, all of my students have found ways to, uh, to really process the world that they're in through art. And I hope, in turn, provide something that helps you recognize what it is that you encounter um, through your engagement with art itself. So I dedicate this talk to my students. Um, as you probably started to notice also, as I was mentioning, it is quite a range. Um, painting is a really ancient practice. Uh, we can think back to cave paintings, for instance, but it's also very contemporary. And the students um, here, I think, show you know, what a range it really can be. There are some basic-ish parameters about what painting is. Um, we have a lot of conversations about that. Um, it is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's kind of both a noun as an object, but also a verb. That's a gerund. Um, and so as a noun, it's a material thing, usually bound by something, um, somewhat flat-ish, maybe, color on a surface-ish. Um, uh, but it's a set of discourses, histories, uh, paradigms, um, technologies that is constantly being updated and um, uh, you know reinvented, challenged, and um, as President Brown said, you know can can provoke um, uh, and can can do all kinds of things. So we you know we really think of it in in such a broad way. And yet, there is something shared through those discourses and those histories, whether we accept them or reject them. Um, it's also a verb, you know, requiring the body in this way. It's not an image. Um, and uh, although that can be very much, you know, part of it. And, um, and of course, paintings today, as you're seeing here on the screen, encountered through a digital image, totally out of scale, out of context. Um, and so that's something, uh, something else that we talk a great deal about. Uh, I also want to note on the screen, um, my paintings, which I will show you later on in the presentation, are by and large fairly small to medium sized. So this is the most monumental image of them that probably can exist and will exist. So I wanted to let you know that. Yeah, paintings kind of, in my experience of making them and looking at them, they seem to materialize a kind of ineffable experience that you don't know how to make, you know, put into language or find other ways to, yeah, to make sense of. And, um, and it's, uh, they don't always do that. Um, sometimes they're just material on a surface. But, um, but they have the capacity to do that. And these, the way that they can congeal experience you know, as I mentioned, kind of directly, like I was here, I made a stroke, but also I've looked at all these paintings. I've looked at all these things in the world, visual culture, advertisements, surfaces. There's a kind of memory that the body has, a sensation of touch that, uh, that is very interesting to consider, you know, when it comes out, um, uh, you know, materially, when it gets externalized and realized. Uh, I think it's, um, it's something that is, um, uh, uh, you know, quite um, extraordinary, and it's uh, certainly worth, uh, you know, I've devoted my life to it, um, and I think of it as, um, as very much alive. We've all heard about painting dying and coming back to life, but, um, but it very much is alive, and certainly it is over at 808, so. Um, so that's, um, and I'm just going to advance um, very br briskly through the rest of these uh, so that I can begin to introduce my own practice. I also want to say a word about our faculty too. You know how we teach painting here. Um, there is no one way to do it. There is no one style. There is no one methodology, um, because um, well, each one of us has never lived before. So we have to really kind of reinvent it for ourselves. <clears throat> uh, and 
and here you can get a glimpse of this. I, I think some of the students here and um, alumni are in the audience, I hope, so they can see their own work as well. So I myself, just like my colleagues, I'm just another old artist um, and uh, I uh, have, have my own terms that I've established for myself, my own priorities, sensibilities, uh, aesthetic uh, kind of direction that I take for myself, how I want to spend my time, um, how I want to, um, yeah, what I want to see, you know. And I think there is something about, as I mentioned, all these kind of internalized ways of coming into contact with the world, but there's also this desire to want to want to see something new, want to see it. And the great thing about, I always say this at the beginning of the semester, come in, the walls are all really fresh. Three months later, we have final reviews and there's so many, um, uh, so many paintings that didn't exist three months prior. So how does that happen? How does this kind of process of visualizing something, materializing it, realizing it, and having it come before you, um, uh, you know, take place? And these are our current students here right now, some of whom have just started their first semester of a two-year program. All right, so those were some big statements about painting, but hopefully kind of introduce, uh, you know, some of the fundamentals of, of what, you know, where it's at today and give you at least a kind of visual sense of the range and uh, diverse approaches that, that, you know, the discipline can, can hold. Um, my practice is, you know, it occupies a very small space within that. Um, and I, um, now that I've got the big things out of the way, now I can focus on the small things because my work really does deal with the small things. Um, uh, and I'm going to uh, share a little bit about my artistic practice more generally. And then I'm going to um, uh, kind of, there will be one part about that. And then I will share some recent work with you. So, as, a, as an artist, um, uh, I, think in, I think in ways that is not reflected in my, my paintings. Um, I will say that as an, as an art student, I studied all different approaches to what uh, visual art could be. And so I think in ways that don't necessarily relate to painting. In fact, it was through, and I wanna say this for the students, it was really through photography that I kind of came to recognize myself as an artist because I wanted to be out in the world, I wanted to see things. And I have a practice of encountering things, you know, surfaces, objects in the world and then making a painting of them um, uh, just face to face. And I didn't always have this, but um, uh, but it has come to be a foundation of how I how I make art is really something experiential, something direct, and um, that's um, in relation to something else in the world. Um, it's um, it's very simple. Um, probably most of you have have done this uh, at some point in your life but it's helped me kind of understand what it is that I'm interested in through, uh, through this practice, um, through looking at something and making sense of it, as opposed to knowing it ahead of time and seeking that out and, and kind of um, uh, picturing that. Um, here's some snapshots of my painting practice over the years. Um, this is, uh, uh, these are just photographs I've taken where I've been painting on site. And some people um, have called this way of painting um, uh, plein air painting, which is a French term um, meaning in the open air. And in fact, most of my work does happen outside in, in over the course of daylight hours. Um, but there's also other words for it um, that are you know, observational painting. There's representational painting. Uh, as opposed to abstract painting. There's also perceptual painting. Um, and these are different kinds of uh, terms trying to get at this experience, I guess, of, of looking at something and, and making something of it. Um, the history of it is uh, in those kinds of terms in a Western context has to do with um, French painting and the rise of the middle class, um, leisure time, access to travel, 
going around making paintings outside in relation to uh, things around you. Um, here's a you know, famous Courbet painting uh, where that's Courbet on the right and he has his easel on his back and he is um, you know, walking around. And you can even see what's interesting about this painting too is you can see the mode of transport over here as well. So this, this took people you know, out of uh, where they were in their communities and able to kind of travel around um, with, uh, with extra time on their hands to make something of it. I'm not sure that I um, feel, have felt all that kind of comfortable with these terms myself. I've always felt a little ornery. Um, and, uh, and so, and I'm still trying to figure out why that is. It is, um, uh, it's not the only tradition I feel connected to. Land art, for instance, is another one. Photography, as I mentioned. Um, but there's, um, there's, Maybe part of that discomfort has to do with the fact that it's such a popular kind of mode to make um, art that is in the sense of it uh, being kind of uh, associated with amateurism um, or um, something, you know, sketching, you know, preliminary, not the finished piece. And so um, there's, you know, in the kind of hierarchy of, you know, high art and low art, um, I, there's something about it that is uh, so accessible as a kind of, you know, history that it has, you know, has found its roots in kind of more regional traditions. And, and, um, uh, and in fact, I'm from Cape Cod originally, and, and I have studied painting in Provincetown, which was one of those regions where there was abstract expressionism, you know, post-war, but it was also um, the, the kind of plein air tradition was still there. So I'm interested in that, and I've always been interested in that. I've been interested in, you know, regionalism and, and smaller histories, um, despite, you know, being educated and living in New York for many years, which, of course, has, is in the shadow of um, abstract expressionism. At least it was when I was a student. So if I could invent a new term for what I do, I think I would probably call it relational painting, somewhat collaborative, something which is in relation to it's not just a subject, it's because it's not about a picture. It's about, um, it's, it really is something more experiential. So there's time, um, there's feeling, there's psychology, there's uh, chance. These are all kinds of conditions that combined with myself, my materials, um, and, the, and something I, I happen upon are, um, uh, are all kind of mixing together to make something um, uh, there's a picture of some paint. There's actually a tree slug that fell into it, so <laughs> someone else wanted to get involved. Um, it is it, this, the kind of anecdotes, and I will tell some of them tonight, but there are many that happen in this very chancy way of working, um, and it continues to be extremely uh, rich and meaningful as a practice. Um, like long exposures, kind of, I, work, I, I worked for many years, um, uh, wet into wet is what we call it, which is when the paint is wet, you paint into it and then it dries. Um, and for me, it was almost like kind of making um, a cast of something, like uh, where the oil paint um, would, at, it was usually commensurate with the day. So like by the time the day ended, the paint formed a skin and it was kind of, done. Um, and for me, I tried, you know, many times, especially as a student, to go back into a painting, but I couldn't really find a way to do that. My sensibilities were always in a more kind of direct calligraphic kind of mode. Um, and so, and at, like I said, like an exposure, like it happens, it records it, and then it's, it's there. Um, and this was more like a casting process is how I kind of thought about it. Like impressionism, you know, it took an impression of not just the thing, and there were, many of my subjects were quite shallow in relief, like you're looking at here, but also the day, you know, all the feelings. I really felt like painting, and so this happened largely over the course of a day, although I think by the time I made this, it, things had, you know, extended beyond that, but I was really thinking about how all of these invisible and invisible things can kind of be congealed by paint, by this medium, almost like a spiritual medium that could connect me to something and then, and then leave its residue on the surface of the painting. 
And that was an incredible um, period of my work that uh, took me to many places and I made many paintings. When I think back to those kind of influences, um, I have to mention this Rachel White Reed um, uh, Holocaust Memorial in Judenplatz in Vienna. I lived there in my early 20s, shortly after this was um, made. And it was um, an extremely powerful piece that I continue to think about to this day. Um, it's a library, it's to scale. The books are, um, you see the pages of them, but not the spines, um, which are, uh, this, you know, it's unenterable because it's preserved at a library actually for those who perished. Um, Austrians who perished, particularly Jews who perished in the Holocaust. Um, so the kind of access not, and not access to, um, to um, you know, to a surface or something is it really has been, uh, has remained with me through this piece and it's something that I think about a lot. I also wanted to mention in my work too, um, you know, in as I kind of learned about what I was more and more drawn to um, through painting, I really tried not to know what I was going to paint ahead of time. You know, I wanted to really come upon it. And I wanted to learn what my interests were. Now, my interests were not that interesting. <laughs> Turns out I was interested in things that looked like faces, um, surfaces, um, history, post-industrial stuff, the environment, I mean, you know, yes, these are interesting, but, you know, um, uh, heat and temperature was also something, like in this piece you can see, um, uh, frames, you know, things about painting, of course, um, I was interested in as well. And uh, one thing I started to notice, and just kind of regularly going out, visiting friends, family, had a teaching job or a lecturer, uh, lecturing gig or something, I'd, I'd have an opportunity to go somewhere else. I was able-bodied, able to kind of go around um, and got to see a lot of the world through this practice. Um, and what I started to notice was, um, uh, was that it really was, um, uh, well, I started to notice a few things. I started noticing, first of all, that things started to choose me. I wasn't choosing them. And that was a really big um, discovery. I felt like they were kind of making eye contact with me or calling out to me in some way. It, was, it started to become kind of spiritual. I used to think that, um, uh, you know, in the genre of still life, which is a term I, I, I think I do feel comfortable using to describe myself, I, I am a still life artist. Um, uh, still life is, uh, is kind of an interesting space between like something that's neither dead nor alive. You know, think about like, um, uh, you know, a lemon, a Dutch still life with like a lemon with a peel coming off. It's like, you know, the fruit might still be juicy, but the rind is dry. You know, it's like in a process of dying. You know, there's always like this kind of like hanging on to life, but also kind of dying. Um, and this is a major theme in my work um, that I'll talk more about. Uh, and, and so still life, um, you know, uh, I think is, it kind of also blurs the, the experience of the, of the subject with that of the maker. You know, something can be dead. You know, this is a side of meat, um, of beef, uh, but it was, um, and actually, I, I wanted to witness this. Um, uh, I, I actually made this painting in a slaughterhouse and um, because I wanted to see where life was. It was very odd that there was still, when I painted it, knowing it was literally dead, there was something still very much alive in it. And, um, and so I was thinking, well, maybe that's uh, me um, bringing my own liveliness to it and kind of imbuing it with a sense of life. Um, but what I kind of started to find was that it was also imbuing me with a sense of being alive. And this was really unexpected. And um, this is uh, something, you know, that has been philosophically really kind of explored through phenomenology, through ways of, um, you know, that we've come to understand, um, you know, where is the moment of contact of, of ourselves into the world? Are we porous? Um, is there a kind of, where is the spirit world? Does it kind of pass through us? And, and painting started to feel like very interesting to me because it was, um, it started to, uh, um, 
uh, collect, you know, all of the stuff on a surface, like almost like a residue. Um, this practice has, uh, you know, as I mentioned, kind of brought me to many places, and I also just want to acknowledge, you know, my own uh, privilege of look at, being able to look at things, being able to be in person, um, and uh, and being able to explore uh, relatively easily, encounter things without fear, and um, and indeed through painting, kind of dissolve the kind of fear um, of encountering something unfamiliar, and that's uh, something I'm also going to talk about that is a recurrent theme throughout my work. Um, I had been, uh, one of the places I traveled to, as President Barron mentioned, I was a fellow at the French Academy in Rome and lived in Rome for a year, and I made a series of these paintings. This was really the end of working in the way that I've just described to you. I really finished what it was that I had set out to do. These were over the course of a night. I was in time with something. They were recorded. They felt like the window, but they felt like me, and they felt like Rome, and they felt like everything. It was just, it was incredible. I felt like, wow, I've really done what I came here to do. And, um, and then I was like, um, okay, what now? <laughs> I, I never saw that coming. I had absolutely, I didn't know what to do after that. And, um, and I, I, and I want to emphasize this because I took a big risk in my work and, um, you know, and changed things a lot as I'm about to share with you. Upon returning to the United States, I, as I had lived, uh, you know, in different countries several times, you know, I was returning as always a sense of awareness of one's own citizenship. Um, I also, and, um, you know, identi national identity, you know, as an American coming back. I also um, moved to Massachusetts, um, uh, which is where I'm from, so I returned after about 20 years. And I owned um, property for the first time. And I was very aware of my own kind of, um, uh, I'm showing this because uh, the, this is, um, I had an exhibition called As I Went Walking, which was um, from this stanza, which is sometimes sung or played and sometimes not in the, in the Guthrie anthem. Also, I live you know, right down the road from the Guthrie Center. So um, this was very much on my mind uh, in Western Mass. And, um, uh, and the line of it is, as I went walking, I saw a sign there, and on the sign it said, no trespassing, but on the other side it didn't say nothing. That side was made for you and me. So here I am, I have come back to America, um, you know, uh, just before r really the 2016 election, um, and, um, uh, or a couple years prior, I was owning property, struck by all these signs around me of kind of ownership, and, um, and I, um, I think perhaps having been so transient, having been operating in a practice which is actually dependent on trespass, it was interesting to have, um, to consider what home and belonging meant to me through this practice. If you're a wanderer, where, what happens when you're, can you wander at home and what is that like? Um, and um, what do you find along the way? So I made a number of these paintings uh, of kind of marks of uh, claims upon the land and, um, and, and also kind of natural reclamations of them um, when nature kind of took back these, these borders. But I was struck by the kind of legal and, um, you know, ways my legal rights and taxes and everything. I mean, it was very acute, you know, having also when I left Europe at a time of a, a huge immigration wave, um, and um, and coming to the United States um, as well, it was it was a very it was a very powerful sensation. Also, as I mentioned, you know, kind of uh, you know at a national level, um, you know, U.S. immigration policy changing, making um, travel in and out or citizenship more difficult for many people, and as well as a greater awareness of Native American lands. Um, so uh, by making these paintings. I was thinking of them as kind of relating to a site, which was the boundary of land um, and what that means. To make these paintings, I had to stand on one side um, and look to the other side, just physically, to be there. And with a practice of having to be in person, having to be in public, having to be physically there and embodied in that way, I just felt it. I mean, no one was looking at me, but I felt it. Um, and. Uh, and it really occurred to me that the ground, especially where I made contact with the ground, um, was, um, you know, was a very charged kind of space. 
this is the only picture I could find of my feet. Um, so you'll see, <laughs> yes, I do wear red sweatpants. Um, so uh, apparently. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah. So, what what is the ground, and what um, uh, and what is it as a you know as a painting as well? Um, I you know we talk about for uh, those who who might not have made a painting or experienced this. There is the painting's ground, which is the surface application before you put color onto it. So, how you prepare it. And I wanted to mention here. Um, these are some uh, BU alumni and uh, Danny Levine, who's also lectured here, who've all helped me uh, over the years in trying to figure out how to make a, a, a recipe that can receive um, color in new ways. And um, it was an extremely innovative period over at my studio in 808 of uh, figuring out how to mix um, different kinds of fillers, grounds, materials, et cetera, that would produce the uh, the right effect. Here's some tests we did. That green thing is my dog's tennis ball, just to see what that would be like um, as a ground. Part of this was that I had, as I mentioned, been living in Italy, very inspired by fresco painting. As I mentioned earlier, I was, you know, all, I've always been someone who wanted to make a stroke and have it stay there, you know, and just kind of marvel at it. I mean, I'm I am someone, you know, it's the title of the talk, but I do wonder at very small things, and I love wordplay. Just one letter out of place is, you know, makes my day. Um, so, so there is a sense that, um, you know, I wanted something that could remember and record all of the little things. And with oil paint, I could always move it around and then wipe it off at the end of the day. And I wanted something that would hold my decisions. And fresco is a great um, precedent for that. These are from just south of Naples. Um, uh, in uh, this Lucanian uh, tomb painting, which is very ancient and um, and very well preserved, and you can see the artist's hand, even though you didn't, you know, know necessarily. None of us knew who this person was, but there's such a sense of their spirit that comes through in the work, um, and I, and 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 of time and place and presence, and I wanted to feel that for myself, uh, you know, in a material way. I should also say, you know, material stuff and technique and technology of painting is not any different from the meaning of it. You know, the kind of form and content, you know, for me is very much linked. So I also noticed that this ground, I could start picking up specimens of the ground. These are from outside of Georgia O'Keeffe's home in um, uh, just north of Santa Fe in Abiquiu. And I could grind them up and put them into the surface of my painting and sand them down and reveal a kind of almost like evidence of, of a place where I'd been. I also incorporated dry pigments um, as opposed to paint as a way to better understand um, uh, you know, color, I guess, um, an integration of color into the surface. And in general, I was I wanted this um, uh, sense of handwriting and, and kind of indelibility to really kind of take hold. You can see I adapted the practice. This is the same um, uh, practice of working on site, um, making paintings of things right in front of me. In this case, for a period of three years, it was um, of sections of the ground that I would come, up, come upon. I found, incidentally, anywhere you look at the ground, it's interesting, um, <laughs> turns out. <laughs> and so it really is uh, in a very abstract. Um, and it started to really transform in front of me. And here you can see a detail. I mean, obviously it's huge on the screen, but you know, this is—it's more like handwriting. It's—it's—it's it's, um, uh, it's, uh, fairly permanent immediately. And here you can see where that um, this in interior painting, pictorial painting, ends up kind of confronting the the surround or frame that I made for them. And here's a, a photograph of the finished piece. So here in this detail, you can see little bits of rocks, etc., that were in there. I also was thinking about this at the time because I was um, uh, not just craving evidence, but I wanted um, in a relationship to site and locale, um, all of the kind of genius loci of a place, um, the spirit of the place in there, but also uh, you know, at a time when post-fact, post-truth, what is it that we know? What can we really know? Um, and with a practice that depended on witness and of encounter, uh, something which is firsthand, first person, direct, and kind of, um, you know, I swear I saw this. 
Um, I thought this was an opportunity for me to kind of push on that a little more. How, and it was like the more disappointed that I felt about not knowing what it was that I read say, in uh, the news or through various kind of media, um, you know, thinking about the election. In fact, there was just on Friday an article in the New York Times about deep fakes on TikTok. So, you know, how do you really know? Um, and I started to notice that my practice, had, which had been there all along of looking, witnessing, scrutinizing really, was a way of better training myself in some sense to really pay attention and notice. Here's a detail of this, um, of this painting. To additionally, in thinking about the, um, this uh, issue around facticity and, um, and like uh, verification, um, I started screen printing these uh, icons of calibration onto the surfaces of my paintings. Um, here you can see it at the bottom, this ruler, which is it's, it's by hand, but, it's, uh, but it is to scale. And, um, and then uh, this painting, which has uh, screen prints of these coins on it, which is an archeological um, kind of technique to better understand, say, the you know, um, grain of uh, stone, a particular stone. Um, and, uh, and I was, of course, thinking about earlier precedents um, uh, for me, Sylvia Plymouth Mangold, who's um, one of my favorite artists and someone who I share probably the, you know, the most in common with. Um, also looking back to uh, Timothy O'Sullivan, who was a 19th century photographer, uh, who was um, you know, traveling throughout the United States and kind of making these photographs of surveys and you know, uh, witnessing, recording, et cetera. And another artist, Alex Hay, this is work um, where he would take sand from a place and zip it in this canvas bag, kind of like a, a canvas, a painting, and preserve it, you know, for a future, uh, you know, um, exhibition. I think this was in 2016. So, but the sand itself in the bag was from 1969 to 70. There was nothing too small to pay attention to. There was nothing too. And I'm not talking about preciousness, I'm talking about sensitivity, you know. This is also an extremely sensitive ground that I continued working in, you know, the, and, and to this day I have. But it really does record everything, um, for better or worse. Not the first time I'd been thinking about scale. Um, just very briefly, I wanted to show a couple images of some large scale sculptures I made. In this case, very differently than painting, I wanted to make a device that could help someone better orient their own bodies in relation to monumental artworks or distant landscapes. Something, something that was a way of kind of um, drawing, um, of offering permission to kind of draw attention to your own kind of embodied experience of moving through the world as it related to scale. And it was fun, you know, kids would measure themselves and et cetera. Um, this is a, uh, a uh, one-to-one -one scale sculpture of a ruler. It's 24 feet above ground and is currently uh, at the De Cordova um, Museum. And here you can see it really is hand painted. There was also the scale of painting and the hand, the human hand as well, which is not the case with a lot of, you know, um, uh, monumentally uh, kind of scaled industrially made uh, sculpture. So this is, you know, this body of work really helped me consider scale. Um, and uh, just in seminar, we were reading the Gia Tolentino um, uh, essay, on The Eye and the Internet, which, where she talks about, you know, how scale is something. It's really hard to make sense of through the internet, um, one of the problems with the internet. And I think also at that time, I was thinking when I made the sculptures as well, um, of how out of scale everything was, you know, uh, uh, global warming, um, uh, senseless violence. How do you even, how do you make sense of it? I mean, it really is out of scale with a human life um, and uh, out of scale with, with the kind of um, wisdom that comes with from a, from a kind of lifespan. And painting and making art has been a way to, again, kind of train me uh, to, to really feel like I can, uh, maybe I'm just deceived by my own illusion, but I feel like I, it helps me to better kind of come to grips with what it is, um, to come into contact with what, what these uh, you know, enormous unanswerable questions are that are way outscaled from my own ability to understand. One of the, um, one of the uh, kind of 
something that has exceeded scale is, of course, the amount of death that we've all experienced through the pandemic, um, and um, and uh, and continue to as it as it continues on. And um, and I wanted to show this painting. It's a very small painting um, that I made in the summer of 2020, and uh, is a very important painting for me because. Um, it was made a few weeks after I lost my father to COVID. And um, so in, in the sense, it's a, it's a memorial portrait for, I've come to think of it as that. Um, and, uh, and so it's no surprise then, I think, that my, my work has kind of returned to memento mori, to, you know, to these themes of death and life, like I was mentioning earlier in still life. Part of it was also that I was out in the Southwest. Um, I was an artist in residence at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum um, and made some paintings at her house, and this is in Ghost Ranch. And of course, O'Keeffe, like myself, is someone who, uh, for whom um, uh, Memento Mori Vanitas painting a reflection on uh, the kind of life cycles of um, death and rebirth, you know, are very much present in her work. And I think we all, we all are familiar with those pieces of hers. But what was interesting to me that I found being there, and I was, I was uh, not quite sure how this would really go, because um, uh, I, I don't know, you know, how do you make art, you know, in Georgia O'Keeffe's house? It's like, huh. <laughs> um, but uh, what I learned is I was very, I became very keenly aware of the act of memorializing her, like how she is remembered to other people. And people come to their, uh, to, you know, her house and to the museum with a lot of expectations about who Georgia O'Keeffe is. Um, in fact, the curator asked me, when was the first time you, you learned about Georgia O'Keeffe? And I was like, I just think I came out of the womb knowing about Georgia O'Keeffe. Like, <laughs> it just, she was always there. Um, and so, you know, there are, there's a lot there. And I think that the, the museum is, um, you know, I was noticing the ways in which the institution is preserving her memory or, or not, et cetera. This painting, for instance, I made of, and I couldn't touch any of her things. This is of her rocks. I later found out that each rock has an accession number written on the bottom of it. But because I couldn't touch them, I didn't know that. So these she collected on walks and would put in her pocket. Then the museum has, you know, archived them, et cetera. So, um, uh, which was interesting because I was using the ground from just outside the perimeter of her house to grind up and put into my paintings. Um, <laughs> Nearby, uh, just um, kind of in the region, is uh, I, I came upon a um, an unexcavated Native American pueblo, um, and where I mean, it was quite vast, you know, from rains and um, storms surfacing these fragments from uh, pottery shards, pre-contact pottery probably, which has come up and really bears these traces of painting. Someone else had you know painted them, so. Not unlike the frescoes, they were. It was very legible that there was a, a human hand um, in the works here, or several. And it was really striking the ways that um, that just down the road there was this one individual who had, you know, a whole staff in museum dedicated to preserving a life, you know. And here there was this um, lack of infrastructure resources to preserve that too. This kind of just made me really think about what gets remembered and what doesn't, especially set against the background of all this loss, who is remembered, who isn't, um, just again, the scale of it. How do you kind of wrap your head around it? And so here I was kind of trying to make sense of all this stuff about the museum and, um, and O'Keeffe, et cetera, and I came upon this pile of sticks. I don't know why um, it called out to me, but it really did. And I just want to show a couple images and say a few words about how I came to think about this painting. Um, so here it is again. Um, this is a detail of it. Uh, I think what was interesting about it was I was, it was June, so the days were very long. It was very hot and dry in the Southwest. Um, and I was feeling like baked by the sun, you know, salty and dry and, um, and really, um, you know, almost like abraded by the wind as well. And previously, you know, in the week or two prior, I'd come upon several sets of bones um, on some hikes that were, one of which had a hide still attached, a cow bone, left to dry and bake and bleach in the sun. And these sticks really felt like, uh, they felt like bones to me as well. 
And the more I was painting it, and maybe it was the brightness of the sun or just being there, but I started to see how it was, um, I started to get confused. It was like, were they sticks or were they bones? Were they, were they bones or were they my, my father's bones? Were they his legs? Were they limbs? Were they not? Um, and were they the roads that I took to get from Massachusetts to, um, to, to New Mexico? You know, I was, and this was this kind of, this is where things, I mean, it was a hard time for me, but it was uh, artistically, I think it's a good example of the ways that, again, back to painting this, this act can, you know, can sensitize oneself to an encounter that is very complex, you know, it is more than meets the eye. And it really helped me um, think about uh, death and my own death. I mean, I was also, I think, losing a parent, you know, that happens. Um, and I was really aware of, of my own mortality in this way. Oddly enough, painting it made me less afraid of death. I felt like, okay, I know where I'll end up somehow. And that's what this pa painting means to me. Um, I wasn't the only one uh, thinking about memorials on the ground. This is another painting I made, a roadside memorial that someone had made for a friend who perished in a car accident at like a nearby kind of bend in the road. And, um, uh, and this was um, uh, a Descanso's kind of um, uh, memorial to a friend who's lost. In fact, you can see in the center there's a plaque that is uh, you know, indicating, uh, you know, friendship there. Um, and I was drawn to these flowers. They were plastic, very durable, and they, uh, there was a way that they kind of cast shadow and took the light that felt really like the intention of the artist who made this memorial felt very clear to me. Kind of like in O'Keeffe's where I was feeling the intention of the act of memorializing her, you know, in this sense, I felt like I was painting more the act of someone memorializing someone else who'd, who'd left, um, which of course was my own way of probably learning about how to memorialize. Meanwhile, painting in this way, which is, you know, I, I just don't, I wanna make sure I don't forget to say this, so I wanna say it, you know, in the last several years, I really wanna make painting that remembers better than I ever can. You know, I wanted to remember what, I wanted to remember that I was alive, I wanted to remember that what, you know, the sense of liveliness that exists. And to do that, this ground has been very helpful in that regard. It really seems to remember everything. Not so that I can forget and it can kind of take the load off, but more so that it can, it can out, outlast um, me in that way. Um, I, and not just because of my own sense of wanting to live on, but, but really kind of like if, I, if there is a time when I, can, when I forget. Also, I did. Also, my father, who I lost, had Alzheimer's. So, that, you know, I feel like maybe that's helpful to say. Um, what is memory, and uh, and how does it how does it get kind of materialized in some way? This is a very reassuring kind of way of of, uh, of you know archiving experience, I suppose, for later. And indeed, that sticks painting really helps me remember what it is I've learned about death. So, you know, some of my reflections are, uh, you know. Um, uh, about my own life, some are, you know, about others. Some, you know, wonder can be bafflement as well. Like, for instance, friends are the flowers in the garden of life. What does that mean? You know, <laughs> does it mean that your, you know, your friends are like gorgeous and then they die and then other ones come into the picture? I don't know. I mean, it just is, um, you know, uh, chance to be curious, chance to laugh. Um, and also, I will say, I. Here's this, a painting of the setup there. It was in the morning light when I painted it. Um, turns out this particular pullover is where a lot of other planner painters like to come. So um, this is not the first time. So I had some company, normally they paint um, distant views. Um, so, um, but you know, it's, uh, and actually I will say there was one time when I was painting in the UK, this was many years ago, I, it was a 13th century abbey, as there are ruins. Um, one has to paint there. And I was there and set up all my things, and I was very excited to go. Two busloads of plein air watercolorists arrived <laughs> to paint right next to me. So there were probably about 100 watercolorists. And it was in England, so no one said hello. Um, <laughs> but, but we were all just, you know, cool about it. 
<laughs> anyway, so um, you know, it does. There is a sense of camaraderie and collegiality that does happen from time to time. Um, but sometimes people get suspicious too, who are not other art artists. And this is a picture I took. This is the only picture I could take. That arrow is pointing to a police car. Um, and um, this was this spring as well. I was painting um, um, this train on the right. And I guess it was, um, uh, turns out someone had uh, reported me to the police. And um, the police had to come over this fence, which was quite a ways away come over um, and tell me I had to leave. And, uh, and it is, um, uh, this has happened once, you know, once or two, several times, but you know, it's, <laughs> but it, it's, it's no less, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's very rattling, you know, and um, it's really upsetting. And um, it wasn't just upsetting that I had to confront a police officer to check my license and do all this, but also that, um, you know, someone was watching me. Now, I will say, I was probably driving very slowly, looking for places to paint with Massachusetts plates, um, you know, in southern New Mexico at the major freight line between Juarez, you know, and um, Chicago. But, um, you know, so I, I get it a little bit, but it was, it was hard to take in that confronting that su the suspicion of others is, um, is something that this practice has also made me have to do. Uh, you know, when I look closely at something, I, I'm probably a little too close, um, you know, for comfort somehow, like, what are you really doing? Um, and in fact, the police officer told me that there were several very pretty views that I could paint if I just went up to a top of a mountain uh, and looked out. So, you know, the expectation of landscape or of distant views somehow makes, it brings a sense of comfort. That said, to some people, that said, you know, in the case of the roadside memorial, um, this painting, I uh, ended up meeting the person who made the memorial because she passed by and saw this. And it was, in, it was a really um, a meaningful encounter because, I mean, she was curious, like, why are you doing this? But also, like, that's beautiful, which I appreciated. But also it was a chance for us to tell stories with each other, um, you know, about loss. And I think that, um, you know, this, when you making art in public, there is a kind of quality of, of ch you know, chance encounter. You don't know, it's risky, um, it's awkward, and it's, um, but it can also be very beautiful. And, um, and I certainly felt like there was a, a kinship that came through, you know, that exchange. Um, another roadside pull off I painted at this um, past year was this uh, a points of interest sign. And um, I do have a few, a few more things to say, but I also recognize that I think I'm, I, I should maybe wrap it up shortly. Um, but um, uh, this, uh, I was, uh, you know, I think it also speaks to my interest in trompe l'oeil. Again, kind of, um, you know, here's a, an art historical example. Something that also kind of can sharpen your eye in terms of what it is that you're looking at and uh, better discern, you know, for yourself um, how you see what is there. Um, and what isn't. Um, the last um, painting that I, uh, uh, from, from this painting, I, I, um, I was thinking about these different layers to it, um, and it was quite flat. After that painting, I remembered something very important, which was about air and light, which I'd kind of forgotten in this kind of literal scape of the ground, and the kind of desire for evidence of something, a fact, I'd kind of forgotten about the stuff that's in the air that you don't really know about, although of course it's, it's always in the practice. This reminded me of that. And, um, and I will say that it kind of taught me um, uh, if there is an arc from still to life, I think there is in my work, you know, this kind of back and forth um, uh, yet again. So this attunement to all the things that are around us that kind of can bring out that sense of liveliness um, and vitality uh, and, you know, uh, reminders to, you know, to attend to all those little things that really make up who we are. So that's where I'll leave it right here and happy to take questions. Thank you.
have some time for questions. We have mics. If you raise your hand. Hi, thank you. Uh, just to start off questions, I noticed in some of these paintings there was like a sparkly element and like there's a shimmer and I didn't know if you wanted to talk about that at all. Is that, I feel like it's a shift that happened with some of these paintings and when, like why that shift happened and if that means something to you, more like symbolically or? Um. Well, I think painting the ground, I was very sensitized to minerals, you know, what are, uh, what are rocks? What are these things that kind of glisten occasionally and catch our eye? Um, but moreover, it's, it was in my oil paintings as well, but uh, doesn't it's something that doesn't translate digitally. So what can, what can be there in person that you can kind of remember from that sensation of, en of encountering a painting in person? Um, and this is a practice that is, entirely about being in person. It's funny, this term in person, which we all, which we all had to you know, adopt really quickly and then said it pretty much every other sentence um, for two years, um, was actually a phrase that I was thinking about for, for years prior. So, um, so that was exciting, actually. Um, but yeah, it is about that kind of experience in person. I think you've seen some of these paintings in person, so I'm glad you can see that. Thanks. Thanks so much, Josephine. That was a great uh, introduction to some of the work I didn't know and an overview of some things I've seen before. I'm wondering, when you were talking about your interest in Trompe l'oeil and you were showing the William Harnett painting, it got me thinking about time and how you deal with the, these, you know, the plein air painting and, and this pretty quick movement you need to make through the process to get a painting done within a relatively short amount of time. And so then I'm thinking about the Harnett practice of Trompe l'oeil, which is very painstaking and slow and, you know, across multiple days and, and probably weeks. How do you think about your work and, and how does temporality really factor into the process of it? Because um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested too in how drawing seems to play a really important role here because you're conveying a lot of detail and a buildup of visual information, but you're doing it in a pretty short amount of time. So how does that work? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that because I will say those earlier paintings that were in a day or a night, you know, in that kind of cure casting of, of the day was also really conditional to these external forces of the sun rising and setting and just something being, um, being in tune with something beyond myself. I mean, this is also a practice of encountering something beyond myself that is not from my lived experience or my background, my past, you know. And same with each day, it's all new for all of us. So I think I was trying to kind of um, be in, in relation to the day as something external. Uh, one of my collaborators, I'd say, there's you know, this thing, there's materials, but there's also this kind of constant movement of the day and being almost like in a dance with it, you know. Um, as I move more towards this indelible way of working, that's so instantaneous, like I have a thought, I have a decision, it's there, you know, and it's there in this kind of um, deep way, uh, literally, you know, as it soaks into the surface. But these newer paintings take a long time, you know, a month or so, and they're, um, uh, and they're slow and, you know, revisiting them. And I didn't get a chance to show you one more, but I do have a, an exhibition this spring, maybe, maybe people can see it um, in New York, but, but those are, um, paintings that, that are, that really chronicle something. Change of season, for instance. I started with these bright green leaves and then they were yellow and now they're brown. You know? um, so there's something, the kind of like accumulation of time that happens over the course of the painting. And I think those years ago when I, when I talked about my work as, you know, paintings in a day, what I probably should have said is they're paintings that are in relation to a specific period of time, which happens to be a day. You know, and now it's you know it, it's changed over the years, but um, but I also make many works as I did throughout my travels around the U.S. that were really in a day, you know, um, 
And, and it is related to drawing. It is related to a sketch. And I've always been interested, can you take the sketch and make it the real thing? I mean, Constable's paintings of clouds. Give me one of those any day over the hay wain, you know? <laughs> but it's just, that's, that's kind of, um, you know, it's something ephemeral, something that is in time. Um, and that's a, that's a sensibility that carries through into the work. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, in 1990, I believe it was in this room, uh, Christopher Rex, before it was renovated, uh, Christopher Rex gave his university lecture talk on literature and the matter of fact. Hmm. Christopher and I disagreed on the nature of imagination. I have a more transcendental view of it perhaps than Christopher did or does. Could you say more about imagination? You, early in your talk, you, you use the term phenomenology. Later in your talk, you're talking about memory, remembering. In brief, when I look at your paintings, your work, before I get to the wonder, I must have some imaginative capability. I must be true to some fact and yet not be limited by it. I must go further. I'm just searching for your thoughts on imagination. Thanks, I absolutely love that question because it's challenging as well. And, um, uh, I, I was really averse to um, fact and, uh, you know, approaching that. In fact, I almost titled an early show of my Matters of Fact, um, but was talked out of it um, by wiser people than myself um, because I wasn't ready to kind of take that on. Um, but I think I was hesitant about it because I didn't want to lock in meaning. I wanted, I, as I do with, with what I love as a viewer of art, I like to be free to wonder what it is that I, that I see in it. And my concern was always, well, if I'm too literal, then people will mistake me for wanting a particular outcome. Um, that does happen. And, um, and it's a disappointing, you know, because that's not what I'm after. It's not about an, an answer or, a, or, a, or you know, being right about how you, you know, read the painting. An expression, actually, I'm kind of averse to um, because I prefer experience because it keeps it more open. But fact is, um, you know, I started, uh, I didn't show you this work, but after the, or before those night window paintings, which was to scale, one to one scale, I had made paintings of some rulers and they were very literal. And I was shocked by the way that they still felt um, uh, f imaginative um, in some way. Like how can something so literal be that? And I became less afraid of it and in fact, you know, when I think about, say, Via Selman's rocks, or you know, as I'm, you know, Sylvia Plymouth Mangold's, um, you know, uh, ruler here, another artist who's been very important to me, Jennifer Bartlett, in terms of fidelity to time, um, I, I actually, that's a place of, of real excitement for me and curiosity. Um, that said, I have considered looking at something, and to try to activate my imagination alone. But actually, it doesn't work. I have, to have, I have to make something of that encounter to unlock my imagination. So I would answer you by saying that it's actually in the making, in the kind of relation with something else, in relation to materials, in relation to time, in relation to place and feeling. That's where, OK, it might be very literal in the end, but, or it, it might appear that way. But actually, in what, it, what it really is for me is reality just in these set of relations is so exciting. Um, there's so much going on. There's so much chance that can kind of bring anything into some configuration at any given time. Uh, you know, it's, it's really um, the kind of thingness of the world and how uh, these relations start to kind of activate each other is, you know, uh, all you have to do is really kind of pay attention to it. For me, I have to pay attention to it, but I also have to make something of it for it to really come alive. And that's how I'd probably define imagination for myself. Yeah. 
Thank you. I just wanted to, I, I really enjoyed your photographs of your paintings in the setting, and you talked about sort of starting out maybe from a photographic perspective. So I guess the question is, um, do you think of those in some way as part of your work, or, or do you think about presenting those formally and, you know, it, along with the paintings or any, is that, do you, or do you consider those just explanatory for the purpose of this talk? I guess I would answer both. I mean, I feel like this is the form for them. Um, you know, there, I don't think that there's something that is, that rises to art for me, um, but they do feel residual of that experience, and I think, you know, as a teacher, which is, you know, just as much a part of my, my, I mean, my artistic practice is very much there, but I'm, you know, as a teacher, um, pedagogically, you know, that's a, 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 another adjacent aspect of my work. Um, I will say, you know, I'm not sure I would make these paintings if I weren't a teacher, and I definitely wouldn't be teaching if I didn't make art. So, you know, there is something, you know, um, that is kind of um, symbiotic and, and reciprocal in that way. And I think in a kind of didactic sense, you know, the photographs do a good job, but I, um, but I think this is the place for them, um, and uh, at least for the moment. I also really like the artist talk as a form, and that's something I've experimented with, and we'll probably do again. Like that, I could imagine rising to, you know, rising to the status of art for me. but kind of different. I remember you mentioning at towards the beginning of the lecture, um, like kind of using photography to come into like your artistic voice. So I was just curious, like now, how do you view photography? And I guess what distinctions you make between painting and photography, both as just like separate mediums and also like why paint something versus take a photograph of it and vice versa. Yeah, and actually I had the same question for myself a couple years ago. I took a photography class um, because I wanted to get back into it and see what it was like. And I kept thinking, oh, photography is so fast and, you know, it'll be like, I'll be really agile again, you know, I'll unlock, because I was really in this kind of, you know, in the groundwork and um, it was very labor intensive and, you know, slow. And I thought, I know I'll do something fast. So I, I took this class and the teacher hooked me up with a four by five camera, an analog camera. and what it took to make one image on that camera was so slow. <laughs> I was like, God, get me back to painting. It's so much faster. Um, and it was, I mean, granted, it was analog. You know, of course, I take photos on my phone all the time, et cetera. But photography, I think, just as a, as a, as a discourse, as a way of, as a technology, as a way of thinking about relations, I think it does a good job at that in a way that painting, you know, doesn't always, you know. Also, when I was talking about it at the beginning, I was thinking about being an art student. Like, in what, when I was an art student, you could, you could go, you know, in the studio. You, that's where paintings were made, and painting was not very popular at that time. You know, there were only about four people making paintings in my class. Um, then, um, you know, if you were a sculptor, that's where you had big ideas. You know, um, and uh, printmaking, that's where you were, you know, collaborative. And there were just these kinds of cultures of each thing. And photography was the, was the one place where you could kind of, you were supposed to go outside of the institution. And when I think back about those early influences of mine artistically, like I showed the White, Rachel White read, but before then, thinking about murals or um, street art um, uh, advertisements, uh, music that happened outside too. This was something that was really um, exciting to me. And painting, for whatever reason, you know, I think, you know, we can talk about those reasons, but, you know, it sometimes gets locked in a studio, you know, um, and, um, uh, and I, why is that? Um, and when did the institution become a space of creativity as opposed to kind of like a, a space of feeling a little bit enclosed? Um, so those are institution meaning, you know, like art school, for instance, or uh, et cetera. So I think, I think those inspir early inspirations were, I was kind of given permission through photography to leave and explore and see what I came, you know, came upon.
Thanks. Um, that actually gives a good transition to the question that I had, which is, um, as you recognized earlier in your discussion, you appreciate the mobility you've had and the ability to go to a lot of places and then have things speak to you. Um, if that mobility were taken away and you were now unable to travel in that way, would you see yourself similarly having things speak to you in your more immediate environment? Well, I think that as I went walking, show was really like, what happens when I'm mobile through walking, you know, through being local? Um, and, uh, and that was also around the time I, I came here to BU to teach as well. So I was able to really deepen my kind of, instead of, you know, this breadth of, I mean, without really having so much um, of a kind of sense of home, uh, I, I really made the best of it suited me, you know, at the, at the age that I was and what I was doing in my life. But I think, you know, I, I think that in the last, I don't know, six, seven years, really kind of drilling down deep in terms of what, you know, what it is I want to do in relation to place. Um, drilling is not the right word. <laughs> um, just, you know, feeling a sense of place and rootedness um, is, uh, has really come through in my work. And, um, uh, and it's, um, yeah, and in some of the, the recent paintings, I've kind of only got to those southwestern ones, but there, there are some from, from Massachusetts that, that I've been working on as well. One more. There's one there. Yeah. Hi. Um, you were talk. We were talking about photography earlier, and I was wondering because you capture a lot of detail in your painting. Do you ever use photography to help you with that, or what are your thoughts on like painting from photography? Because I know that you paint outside a lot too. Mm -hmm. Do you ever like take a picture of what you're painting to like see it better, like, or and what are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts would be then I would be making a painting of an experience of looking at a photograph, you know. Um, so what are the conditions for looking at the photograph? Would I be inside? Would I be? Would it be at night? Would I be outside? Would I be? Would it be printed? Would it be on the screen? You know, um, I'm not sure that that's that interesting to me. Also, because it would I'd be looking at my own intention, my own framing, you know, my own choice of something, as opposed to a sense of you know encounter and unpredictability. It's interesting, um, one image I edited out, but I don't know if any of you do Dolly, use Dolly, the artificial intelligence um, kind of, you know, I, I've, I try to type in the words that will describe my own paintings to see what comes up, just, you know, for fun. <laughs> and, the, you know, they get pretty close. I mean, and I work at it. Um, and, uh, and the thing that Dolly will never have is the unpredictability, of the chance of what it means to kind of be you know, be moving through space and time and encounter something and bring all those feelings that you have it, that are within you to that moment, you know, and all the latent feelings of expression that are kind of rising out of the world around us that I feel like a practice like mine helps me tap into. So taking a photograph of my own intent and then using it as information is not that inf interesting to me because I'm really, you know, I don't want to say that I'm anti-information, but it's I'm after something different, and I think it has to do with um, something maybe closer to knowledge, you know, or feeling. Or, um, and I do make a distinction there, um, and I do think it's totally possible for someone else, and perhaps myself as well, to take a photograph that can that can exceed information to become something that is so imbued with all of those other kinds of conditions that I'm talking about. I'm not sure I'm the right one to do that at this moment in my life, but, um, but there's something about the language of painting that really allows me to do that and have access um, and congeal all these, all these forces at play. Thanks for that question. One last question over here. Hi, Josephine. Um, so I feel I felt like I had this really nerdy question where I just wanted to ask you about like how you um, pick your canvas sizes, but I think it really actually does tie to that question of if you're sort of um, going out into the universe and seeing objects call to you and you're on the road and you have these really intense grounds, how do you um, pair like the making of these uh, like a 31 by 34 canvas with that 
um, ro you know, rock structure or whatnot, is it, are they all pre-planned and then you see something and you're like, oh, it's this one? Or do you see something and then go out and, and make it and, you know, extrapolate on that process? Yeah, thanks, Julia. I mean, I feel like the, the question of frames and edges, we were just talking about this today in Group Crit, and it's like, it is really a fraught space for painters. Um, what is the boundary? What is the edge, you know? Um, I've grappled with this a lot. That's why I made these frames as a kind of almost zone of margin of like to kind of buffer and translate the world to my painting and my painting to the world, you know, like um, because it is, it's abrupt when I take a painting out of its context and put it on say a white wall somewhere, I feel that loss. And that's a major thing that I have zero answers for. <laughs> um, really constantly working with it. Um, a friend of mine said one time, just make a big painting and then people don't look at the edges. So, you know, <laughs> he's not wrong. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, but then it's uh, how do I logistically do it and be mobile and kind of, you know, and kind of, I like to do things also myself by and large too. So, anyway, so these are, um, these are definitely questions. I'm glad you asked that because these are things that are, that are I, I, I work through all the time. Um, I will say that for a while with the, the ground paintings, there were, there were these squares, and those were the size of, of a broadsheet, you know, the New York Times. I was working in a kind of serial way, like through, you know, in a printmaking kind of mode as well. And that was something which was, um, you know, all the news that's fit to print, you know, all the kind of stuff that happens. Um, but it's not something I really talk about. It was really something to consider what is in relation to our body, you know, a traditional, you know, newspaper or something, but something you'd hold that you could kind of, that could contain, um, you know, just the right amount, but you know, that's shifted as well. Well, Professor Halverson, you've left images in our minds that will last um, for some time. We want to leave you at least an image so you remember uh, this evening. Um, let's give uh, Professor Halverson a round of applause. <laughs>